Microphone working? How is everybody? Is tonight also LDS date night? And are any of you going to that? I didn't know if there would be any overlap. Well, I thank you very much for missing that for this. I really appreciate it. Um, I was going to fill you in on some of the recent things happening to us. I don't know how much you follow the Satanic Temple in the news, but the most recent uh, big news that we had is that our uh, reproductive rights case in Missouri is going to the Missouri State Supreme Court, as the Washington Post pointed out. <laughs> One of the nation's longest waiting periods for an abortion will face the scrutiny of the Missouri Supreme Court after a state appeals court ruled in favor of an adherent of the Satanic Temple who challenged the law on religious grounds. The Western District of the Missouri Court of Appeals ruled last week in favor of Mary Doe, an anonymous member of the Satanic Temple, allowing the case to be heard by the state Supreme Court. The hearing date has not been set. The suit challenges Missouri's abortion law that includes a mandatory three-day waiting period and requires that a woman seeking an abortion read a booklet, view an ultrasound, and hear the fetal heartbeat. It alleges those requirements violate constitutional religious freedom. It's being moved up to the Supreme Court after it was originally dismissed by a smart-ass dickhead federal judge <laughs> who waited over nine months on the case uh, to deliberate and then said because she wasn't, couldn't be pregnant anymore, uh, there was no relief that she could be granted, so the case was moot. Uh, the idea in legal terminology would be called uh, capable of repetition but withholding review. And um, that is, is not appropriate, of course, and I feel that uh, that uh, we have a very good shot in the Supreme Court, and the, the lower court that heard our appeal seems to agree. They say we have a substantial constitutional grievance that should be heard by the Supreme Court. So we're, we're looking very forward to that. And it's very encouraging as well, because after Trump got uh, elected, I guess you could say, into office, uh, this emboldened some of the more theocratic of local governments to really cracked down against abortion. Uh, uh, Trump really kind of motivated people when he said during the second debate that he would uh, seek to overturn Roe v. Wade. And immediately after Trump was elected, we saw that uh, in, in Texas, or, or maybe it was Ohio, Texas or Ohio? Oh, this was Ohio. Texas was the burial bill. Um, the heartbeat bill uh, declared that a woman uh, couldn't get an abortion after detection of a heartbeat in the ultrasound. And we were going to fight that also if it were enacted, which it wasn't, on religious grounds. Because according to me in the Huffington Post piece, to us, the heartbeat is irrelevant to the claim of personhood. We do not advocate for belief in the soul, therefore we feel that complex cerebral functions necessary for perception are what makes a person a person. The non-viable fetus, a fetus that cannot survive outside the woman's body, is, we feel, a part of the woman's own body and is her choice whether or not she continues the pregnancy. Our tenets assert bodily autonomy and uphold science as the arbiter of claims over what is true, to which we give deference in our decisions. As the Ohio bill is imposed for no medical purpose and presents no compelling state interest, it is simply a violation of our free exercise. We will fight back against it, and we will very likely prevail. Um, even though this bill wasn't passed into law, I, I feel there's a, a very, um, there, there's a very uh, distinct need to put these messages out while they're being deliberated upon so that the uh, courts know what they could be dealing with, and this could, could affect their decisions later on. And as I touched on, uh, Texas around the same time tried to put forward a law that would say that a woman having an abortion would also have to pay for a proper burial for the aborted fetus. Um, this was just another way to tack on exorbitant fees and make people acknowledge the fetus as a distinct individual human life uh, and, and putting this kind of um, so-called dignity upon it by, by shaming the woman from having undergone the procedure. In there, it said, uh, Texas health officials are boldly imposing the view that the fetal tissue is elevated to personhood, a religious opinion that conflicts with our own. That's what I was quoting to say. 
If Texas is going to treat the disposal of fetal tissue differently from the disposal of any other biological material in contradiction to our own religious beliefs, they need to present a compelling state interest for doing so. Of course, there is no such state interest, and it's perfectly clear that the, the demand for fetal tissue burial is a punitive measure imposed by sadistic theocrats. It's clear these officials deem harassment an acceptable form of pushing their misguided religious agendas. And what it comes down to is the idea of where does life begin? Does life begin at conception or does it not? And if you can't elevate your point of view on that to a scientific absolute, then you must uh, be willing to concede that that's a matter of religious opinion and as such, our religious point of view on it uh, is deserving of protection and the state has no place in imposing a different religious point of view. And the state imposing a religious point of view is far clearer in the Missouri case where we're going to the Supreme Court. Oh, I just thought some of the Right to Life news headlines were funny. Uh, Satanic Temple says humane treatment of aborted babies contradicts our fundamental beliefs. That's, that's, just, that's one spin on it. And of course the headlines that put us uh, in league with Planned Parenthood that has caused a great deal of confusion. We've had to make it very clear that we're not uh, we're neither colluding nor competing with one another. <laughs> but Missouri's informed consent booklet very explicitly puts forward what we feel is a religious point of view. And uh, it does so when a woman goes into the clinic. And at the time we were, we were pushing, we originally filed the lawsuit, there was only one clinic in Missouri. And that meant that a woman might have to travel five, six hours just to get to the clinic. Um, I, I, I believe the... Uh, I believe the most recent research shows that somewhere around 59% of women who get abortions uh, already have children. So they may have to get daycare, they may have to take time off their jobs, uh, they may have to um, stay at somewhere in the vicinity of the clinic because the, uh, the informed consent booklet is meant to be deliberated on by the woman for 72 hours, three days. She has to receive these materials the idea is that she'll read them and really consider whether she wants to do this at all. And then three days later, um, if, she, if she has this informed consent booklet that she had to come get in person, can't look up online, um, then she can get the procedure. And that, that makes it very prohibitive for, for a number of women. But the, uh, the, the booklet itself uh, demands that it be, it be shown to the woman that this statement that the life of each human being begins at conception and abortion will terminate the life of a separate, unique, living human being. Well, we think all those points are arguable. Um, the idea that life begins at conception, uh, life didn't stop or begin, it's all biological material. Um, there's not, not a magic spark where you can say that, that life began and, and we, we, as said in the earlier press release, we uh, place personhood in, in, in complex cerebral functioning. And even the idea of a separate, unique, living human being is debatable as well, because at, uh, before the cerebral functioning is, is present in the fetus, um, you do have a blueprint of life that could split off and, and become twins. So the idea of uniqueness is, is definitely open to debate as well. But as I said, if these points are debatable and you're coming at them from your own, own religious perspective, uh, the government has no place in putting its religious point of view, imposing its religious point of view into the decision you make. Another thing we did recently that got a lot of press was we made some commentary on the, on the, the trial that's going to the Supreme Court that you probably heard about uh, recently. A baker is taking his case to the Supreme Court um, fighting to defend his right to not make cakes for gay couples. And in order to kind of point out a, a certain disparity here, we were making the point that religion is a protected class. One cannot turn down somebody based on their religion for coming into a, a bakery. So a gay baker couldn't turn down the same theocrat who turned down uh, their wedding cake. So we were saying that if gay couples were going to go into a bakery that refused to serve them, we would go to them and make them make a cake for Satan. <laughs> I was asked to go on, uh, 
uh, Tucker Carlson and talk about that. And that was not the uh, that was not the first time I was on Tucker Carlson. The first time I was on the Tucker Carlson show, we were talking about a monument we had made for veterans in Belle Plaine, Minnesota. And in Belle Plaine, Minnesota, they had a a park, a veterans memorial park, where they had put up a Christian memorial with a large cross. Somebody complained, a local complained to the Freedom from Religion Foundation. And the Freedom from Religion Foundation wrote to the officials in Belle Plaine and said that this was a violation of the Establishment Clause for them to have a particular, particular religious point of view endorsed on the public grounds. So they took the cross down. Um, some outside evangelical litigation group came up with the clever idea that they should push the City Council in Belle Plaine to open up the Veterans Park as a free speech zone. So private donations for, mon for monuments could be put there, and then the cross could go back. And this happened. They opened it up as a free speech zone, the cross went back up. So we applied to put a Satanic Veterans Memorial there as well. And um, they approved us, and we built it. And then, uh, after some hundreds of Catholics defend descended onto the, onto the park and protested, the city council removed to shut down the whole free speech zone entirely, rather than have us there. Um, Tucker Carlson had me on his show, and his whole argument was that we weren't really a religion, and I didn't have time to explain to him the reasons I think we are, because he was going to interrupt anyways. So I decided to exploit what cognitive dissonance I could give him by holding fast to the free speech grounds. He said it really didn't matter if we were a religion or not, or if we fit his definition of a religion. Free speech zone is a free speech zone. We could be non-religious Satanists, and we would ha still have just as much right to the, the free speech zone as everybody else. And I think it really hurt his feelings that he was forced to agree with me on that. So he wanted to have me back on to talk about the, uh, the cakes. And the, I was, this was only a couple weeks ago, and I'm still kind of baffled by the whole interaction. So I'll, I decided I'll show it to you. <laughs> The Satanic Temple, it's based in Salem, Mass, is encouraging its followers to find Christian bakers and ask them to bake cakes honoring the Prince of Darkness as a show of support for gay couples who've been denied cakes for weddings. Lucian Graves is the co-founder of the Satanic Temple in Massachusetts, and he joins us tonight. Lucian Graves, thank you for coming on tonight. Um, thank you. I'm of mixed views on this. I mean, part of me wants to take it seriously because there are real legal questions here, but then part of me wants to tell the truth, which is you're just a troll. And working out well, your unhappy childhood. Well, you, you're going on the to have to define us. for me what you what you think a credible religion is at this point, and then maybe you should thank organizations like Liberty Council or the Alliance Defending Freedom when they put forward legal cases claiming that they're taking a religious point of view, and the Supreme Court just taking those at face value. The fact of the matter is, we do have affirmative values. These are an expression of our deeply held beliefs. And I think that's all anybody really needs. Yeah, is I mean, we've had this conversation really before. And you, right, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, right. in the end, this is about getting publicity and hassling people. If you really have sincere beliefs and you're publicity worshiping. Publicity to what end? It's publicity towards, on, towards I, I, issues I, I, we, we truly I mean, I do. Honestly, I honestly think, not to play shrink, but it has to do with what was clearly an unhappy childhood uh, that you had. But I guess my, my question is. If you have these sincere beliefs, if this is a real religion, then why not practice it? Why waste all this time bothering other people who are minding their own business? Are, are you saying why don't we practice it in private and in our own churches and in our own homes? Because then I would say I'm, I'm completely on board with you and, and that's exactly pretty much the message we're putting out. You don't see us going into public forums where there isn't already religious representation. What we're doing is we're upholding pluralism. And even in the case with the case, no, you're not upholding uh, pluralism. You're going and you're seeking out people to bother, and you're you're we're not seeking out small people to yes, bother. You are. We're not. We're not. We're not, you're, we're yeah, not the yeah, ones. Well, maybe I'm misreading up. this. No, maybe I'm misreading We're not story. the ones opening up the forum. Do you ever have an evangelical on and ask them why they need to force their Bibles into schools? Why they need to put up a cross on public property? when they have churches all over the place. I yeah. mean, when you open up that public what, forum, you what have they're to not be doing, for What they're not doing viewpoints. is show, hold on, hold on. They're not, what they're not doing is showing up at your house and saying, you know, say the Lord's Prayer with me, Lucian Graves, and if you don't, then 
I'm going to sue you, or I'm going to get the government to launch a suit against you. You're seeking, you're, you say you and your followers, to the extent you have any, are seeking out small businesses that don't want to accommodate you in order to force them to violate their own beliefs. That's my understanding. Well, it highlights a, it, well, it highlights a disparity. The fact is that religion is a protected class, sexual orientation is not. If you want to be able to deny people service, fine, let's be consistent. The, the gay hairdresser shouldn't have to dress the hair of the evangelical theocrat who wouldn't serve him a cake. Then we're on an equal level. Then well, that's actually, okay. Well, actually, I kind of that I'm fine with that. I mean, I I think if it's your business and and you're being asked to violate your beliefs, I think and they're sincere this beliefs. This does bring then up I some think, troubling questions, though, about protected classes you and, know, and it, race. You know, it does bring up. It does actually. Thriller. Yes, it yes it does. But one of the reasons that this was not an issue after the civil rights movement. I mean, I don't, no one's defending denying people service on the basis of their race, which is clearly immoral and wrong and illegal, and it should be. But questions like the bakery out in Colorado, one of the reasons those haven't arisen in the last 50 years is because people had a sense of decency and politeness, and they didn't feel that it was the right thing to get in someone else's face and force them for the sake of making some kind of public statement to violate their beliefs. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, they didn't behave like sure, you. Sure, then we should... Then, then the gay baker shouldn't be forced to make a make a cake for the evangelical theocrat. And then I'm well, fine but I, with that. I kind I of agree. I actually kind of agree with that. Two but here's, no, but here's the difference. I haven't seen a single case of an evangelical forcing any kind of bakery to bake a cake that violates the baker's personal beliefs. And if there was such a case, I would come down on the side of the bakery because why don't you back off and let people live their lives? In fact, why don't you do that? Lucian Graves, right, exactly. if indeed that's but your you real can't name, because religion is a protected class. So yeah, whatever. They either you're, take you're, away we're making a nonsensical point, religion, and I think you or... should crawl back into your hole. Thanks for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. Insider trading is illegal. Don't try it. You'll go to jail. Ha! Unless you work for the Congress, they do it a lot and they get away with it. That is really the best sell for him to say. You should crawl back in your hole. Thank you very much for coming on. <laughs> but this issue of our authenticity comes up uh, all the time. People question whether we're, we're just uh, whether we're just activists, whether we're we're just uh, we're merely political, or we're we're religious, and we don't see any of those things as mutually exclusive. Um, our tenets are. As follows, one should strive to act with compassion and empathy towards all creatures in accordance with reason. The struggle for justice is an ongoing necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. One's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone, and that's what we invoke uh, with the bodily autonomy cases, including the, uh, the, uh, the reproductive rights case in, in Missouri. The freedoms of, freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend, to willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another, to forego your own. Beliefs should conform to our best scientific understanding of the world. We should take care never to distort scientific fact to fit our beliefs. And that's uh, another uh, core tenet that's in invoked in our lawsuit in Missouri. People are fallible. If we make a mistake, we should do our best to rectify it and resolve any harm that may have been caused. Every tenet is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word. And a lot of people see and hear that, and then they wonder, well, what does that have to do with Satan at all? Those all sound very reasonable, but the idea that Satan should be attached to it seems uh, outright counterproductive because of the reaction it provokes. And there seems to be this kind of prevalent notion that we must have sat around one day and decided the best deity to attach to this, especially being that we're openly non-theistic. We don't believe in a personal Satan. We're atheistic. Uh, we're a non-theistic religion. And we, we uh, renounce supernaturalism. We renounce any type of supernatural explanation for, for any, any events or occurrences. But uh, some of us have a perception of human history the Dark Ages, and then the, the Enlightenment thereafter, and put that in kind of a metaphorical construct in religious terms. The idea that the Dark Ages were the time of Jehovah, a very feudalistic time, a very theocratic time, the time of the autocrats, and, and a time 
that was very much against scientific advancement and progress, against the arts and creativity, and, again, and very much uh, out of tune with today's values of individual liberty. And when the Enlightenment came around, a lot of people did invoke the symbolism of Lucifer and Satan as a harbinger of a new era of Enlightenment, one, uh, a, a cultural mythological backdrop that would embrace pluralism in, in, a, in a new kind of uh, mythological construct that would, that would serve as, as the backdrop for people to understand this new world better and, and accept a diversity. And this plays out in people's individual lives as well. When people grow up in a religious environment and they feel rather oppressed by it, and they come away from it sometimes, like I did, uh, reading these different mythologies and thinking differently about who actually is the good guy. Um, when you begin to see God, and, I, and I, I fully recognize that different people look at these mythologies in different ways, but sometimes you can't separate yourself from the introduction you had to it or what you see certain mythologies doing in the world. But I see this kind of God character as a very oppressive force, whether I believe in a personal God or Satan or not, which I don't. So it resonates very deeply with me, um, even though I'm not theistic, and I think it does for uh, everybody who really identifies with the Satanic Temple as well. But further, we just simply don't think that superstition should have more benefits in a pluralistic society over non-theism. And we're willing to fight that fight and fight for the deeply held beliefs of non-believers to be on an equal level of anybody of any other religious point of view. And uh, one of the ways we do kind of challenge that cultural mythological backdrop is through these kind of icons we're willing to put up on the public grounds when theocrats try to uh, enforce their own exclusive point of view. And in Oklahoma, we made a, a good deal of uh, headlines and international press when we sought to put up a monument alongside a Ten Commandments monument that they had erected. The, uh, the Oklahoma House and Senate passed a bill that allowed for the, the erection of a Ten Commandments monument on the Capitol grounds, claiming that because it was privately donated, similar to the Veterans Memorial situation, that this constituted something of a free speech zone for donated monuments. Uh, the Capitol grounds did. And furthermore, the Ten Commandments were not supposed to be of religious significance, but it was supposed to be honoring the, uh, the, the primary basis of constitutional law. And if you compare the Ten Commandments to the Constitution, you realize there's not any similarity between the two, and that they very much conflict with one another. But there they had opened the door trying to avoid an Establishment Clause case for uh, a free speech zone on the Capitol grounds, and they weren't, uh, they weren't assuming, I'm sure, that anybody would call their bluff and actually offer something else. But we did. <laughs> and we wrote a letter originally that just said we were seeking to put uh, a satanic monument on the grounds alongside the, the Ten Commandments monument. And um, they, they, uh, Oklahoma was very reticent to deli deliberate on this at all. The ACLU had a case in, in process against the Ten Commandments monument, um, but the prospect of a satanic monument caused a lot of consternation amongst the public, and not all of it was bad. Um, a lot of people were, were against the Satanic Monuments to the ends that they were then willing to consider that maybe monuments of religious significance didn't need to be on the public grounds, which I think is perfectly fine. Um, and we made it very clear that we only wanted our monuments to be the, on those grounds because the Ten Commandments were there. If the Ten Commandments weren't there, we would never seek to have our monument there exclusively. So when we were coming up with the design of what our monument would be, um, we thought Baphomet was perfect because this sabbatic goat has been satanized, a satanized image for some time, but it has a lot of binary elements. We didn't want to engrave our tenets on it or anything of the type because uh, our final tenet is about uh, being able to revise your beliefs based upon 
new evidence. So for that matter, we don't, we don't really, uh, the idea of things etched in stone don't really appeal to us. Uh, these things can be repealed or revised at any time. But what Baphomet is supposed to symbolize is a reconciliation of opposites. You have, it's part animal, part human. Uh, you have pointing above and below. You have the two-pointed star in the background, the one point up on the head, and you have the male and female on either side. And to fulfill those obligations of talking about how it spoke to the codification of law, we said it also paid homage to those who were hunted and killed unjustly during the witch hunts, and that uh, this, this monument, in symbolizing that, uh, symbolized also the codification of secular law and uh, innocence until proven guilty, the burden of proof, those types of things. These were all informed by the witch hunts of past. So I felt like we had a solid argument, maybe even a better one than the Ten Commandments had when they were trying to say that it wasn't of religious significance. And I think what was very troubling to a lot of the people in support of the Ten Commandments going up was the kind of grassroots support we ended up getting. And you can see that even in local news reports at certain points. The person behind a proposed satanic monument at the state capitol claims his plan is gaining support. Heather Hope spoke with the leader of the group from New York who is trying to make that statue a reality. Carl, while many Oklahomans, including legislators, feel the satanic monument will never come to pass at the capitol, there are some who feel acceptance is changing, and the group's leader says he's being flooded with support. It's really encouraging. It's, it's really moving, and we do get a lot of messages that uh, start out with the caveat, you know, I am a Christian, however, and they explain they appreciate what we're doing. Satanic Temple spokesman Lucian Greaves says support for a monument at the Capitol is growing by the day. It would be placed next to the Ten Commandments. We've gotten a lot of messages from people saying that they've served in the, they served or are serving in the armed forces, and um, they feel that these values are exactly what they fought for. And they're not alone. There are some Oklahomans who support the idea. I think Oklahoma is becoming more of a progressive state. I think it could definitely happen. This is kind of what America was based on, freedom of religion. And for us to say, whether you believe in it or not, that it shouldn't be there is kind of wrong. But many say the statue goes against core Oklahoman beliefs. Of having little kids around it, uh, that's just ridiculous. I mean, I don't, I don't understand where they come from. Our whole judicial system is based on the Ten Commandments. Whether, whether you like it or not, it's our judicial system. We have to let this play out however it plays out, but we'll, we'll keep pushing to make sure that it's going ahead. The Satanic Temple leader says they submitted designs to the Oklahoma Capitol Preservation Commission, and they hope construction will start soon. Heather Hope, News 9. Heather, thank you. And the group's leader says even if the proposal is shot down, the statue will be placed somewhere for the public to view. The commission has delayed making a decision while a lawsuit against the Ten Commandments monument is making its way through the courts. So that kind of reaction can be horrifying to people who thought that uh, the uh, that Satanists would never have uh, any any public support whatsoever, and then to see that the law is being used uh, against their uh, what they imagined would be their exclusive privilege in the on the public grounds. Um, as it turned out, while uh, while we were actually gearing up to sue Oklahoma for not replying to us on our request, after a while. Um, they suddenly, after a Supreme Court, a state Supreme Court ruling, uh, finding that it did violate their state constitution, pro prohibiting um, this kind of mer blending of church and state, uh, they, they took it down. And um, a close-up of that picture reveals the kind of subliminal messaging of the homosexual satanic agenda at play. <laughs> That was not lost on everybody. <laughs> but the governor uh, of Oklahoma couldn't, uh, couldn't stand for this. And Scott Pruitt, that dumb fuck, he's, uh, he's actually, <laughs> he was the attorney general in Oklahoma at the time. Now he's the head of the uh, EPA. Um, so that, that tells you 
something more about the quality of the Trump administration if you, can, if you didn't already know. But uh, Governor Phelan tweeted that the people of Oklahoma should be able to vote on whether to bring the Ten Commandments monument back to the Capitol. So as essentially she's saying she doesn't understand the, the limits of, of her own authority or the authority of even the voters uh, when it comes to overturning uh, the Constitution. So what did happen some years later, uh, like a couple years later, up into recent times here, was uh, the Oklahoma State Senate tried passing a bill that would allow for the placement of historical monuments on the Capitol grounds. It didn't address any of the issues that had the Ten Commandments originally taken down, which indicated it would have been taken down again because they hadn't addressed them, but they simply said in this bill that monuments of historical significance could be put on the Capitol grounds, such as a monument of the Magna Carta, a monument of the Bill of Rights, or perhaps a Ten Commandments monument as well. <laughs> so obviously this was just another ploy to try to put the Ten Commandments monument back up, but they were more specific this time. It needed to be a historical document. So I started thinking immediately about what kind of historical document could we possibly put up, and they had already specified some historical documents, and I thought they might be able to turn us down and hold strong that only those should apply. In Eventually, I came up with what I thought was a brilliantly simple solution. Here was the rendering I came up with. This would be the front of our proposed Magna Carta monument, where the Magna Carta would be, uh, it wouldn't say that. It would actually have the text of the Magna Carta on a slab like that, and the back of the monument would be this. <laughs> They didn't put structural limitations on it, so that, that would have been the idea. And, I, I I, and at that point, I really wanted it to go through, because I knew they'd look at the application and say, fuck. <laughs> but before we were able to even submit that, I, I guess somebody had some sense in Oklahoma and decided that that, that bill needed to be killed. So that brings us to Arkansas. Uh, little Sunday school, Jason Rapert there with his family. He also has a ministry. Um, he is very openly a theocrat and is trying to push a religious agenda on the public grounds and, and is very open about using his office to do that. And he plagiarized the Oklahoma bill to, uh, to allow for the Ten Commandments monument to go up in Arkansas. So we, also, we applied to put Baphomet there because Baphomet now just resides with us at our uh, Salem headquarters and is just waiting to be dispatched for this type of duty. <laughs> so they said to me that, um, that, that, that Arkansas has been very, very much more communicative th with us than, uh, than uh, uh, Oklahoma has been. But they, they, they immediately set about changing the rules. And they said, before we could be considered, uh, we also needed to have a bill passed to have our monument put up. And in order to have a bill passed to have our monument put up, uh, somebody in the state, or in the legislature or Senate, needed to sponsor this bill. Now, that's just another way of deferring the viewpoint discrimination to somebody else. And it's not, it's not legal either. And we have a legal case. But in order to establish we have that legal case, we need to show that that discrimination happens. So we wrote to all the representatives, and it said, Dear Honorable Lawmaker of Arkansas, this is a follow-up to a previous letter you received from the Satanic Temple offering you the opportunity to sponsor our monument for representation on the state capitol grounds. My apologies if you've already replied to the previous letter. We are simply establishing our due diligence. After multiple appeals for sponsorship, we expect we'll establish that the bureaucratic process employed by Arkansas for monument approvals is indeed discriminatory. When one monument of religious significance is sponsored to the exclusion of another, and the legislative process is openly abused by self-serving politicians like Senator Jason Rapert, we feel it our honorable duty to challenge this constitutional corruption. To reiterate from our previous letter, if you wish to maintain an argument for the legality of the Ten Commandments monument on Capitol grounds, consider sponsoring our Baphomet monument for inclusion on the Capitol grounds as well. 
Otherwise, we are confident that the Ten Commandments monument will be deemed illegal and will come down. Please reply by the end of the week, Friday, the 21st, April 2017. Love, Lucian Greaves. <laughs> and this went through a few iterations because my lawyer didn't like the more aggressive tones. <laughs> We got one message back. We, we got several messages back, but Senator Linda Collins was, was funny. One, one of the senators actually wrote us back and said, there is no way in hell I'd sponsor your legislation. You can quote me on that. And it was because we were Satanists. And we are going to quote her in a fucking federal lawsuit. <laughs> and we can't believe they actually gave us this material. They, we had actual representatives telling, it, telling us that they were discriminating against us. And because we were us, they wouldn't let, allow our monument to go up. They have no legal set. And then she wrote back and said, when contacting the legislature, it is proper to include your full contact information, including address, phone number, and where you live. I am including Senator Rapert in this email as you use his name. Now, I knew this was in reference to Senator Rapert going off in these press conferences and saying that because I use a pseudonym, um, I'm probably also a criminal. And, and that he, he claims that it, in, in his mind, it's illegal that I use a pseudonym at all. And, and that something, something nefarious, something more nefarious than Satanism is going on here. So I wrote her back and I said, hello, Linda. Perhaps your grasp upon the content of the email is only as intellectually informed as Senator Rayford's grasp of the law. <laughs> the email was in regards to the Satanic Temple's request to place our monument on Capitol grounds. The Satanic Temple has a public address, and we have been in correspondence with Arkansas, not only via email, but via post. If you're trying to be intimidating regarding real name claims of fraud, please know that here again, Jason Rayford is simply plain ignorant. Many religions, indeed many professions, take different names, and when not used for purposes of withdrawing from personal responsibility, nor engaging in fraudulent activity, is also not illegal. If you have physical mail you'd like to send us or would like to discuss your sponsorship of our Baphomet monument over the phone, knowing as you must that it's your only chance of keeping Stanley's monument standing, Jason Rayford's actual name is Stanley, <laughs> please let us know. If you're still confused as to what the previous email was trying to convey, please have somebody read it to you slowly. <laughs> Failing that, feel free to reach out to us with any further questions. Happy to help you. Love, Lucian Greaves. At which point I admitted to my lawyer, I said, that was an admitted failure of diplomatic demeanor on my part. He was getting a little upset by the BCC mask. She said, you obviously have no understanding of proper etiquette. Without your full contact information when contacting the legislature, I will assume you are not a serious inquiry, and this is spam and a waste of time. My contact information is public as an elected official. To which I said. <laughs> as seems the norm for a disturbing number of your peers, and especially Senator Rapert, you seem entirely unable to distinguish your personal preferences and ad hoc self-servingly imposed unofficial rules from actual protocol and law. As explained to you previously, and it's entirely ponderous that you would even suggest you're unaware of this, our monument request is on record with your Secretary of State's office. Given your failure to acknowledge this, however, and the implication that you have some type of professional relevant answer to give, if only you knew who you're addressing, I represent, and I gave the full title and address and phone number, if you require a local representative in Arkansas, we have that too. However, that's not who you're in correspondence with now. We've already established local standing, and you failed to describe in any credible way why this issue of an address and phone number is relevant to the immediate discussion. I would further advise you that your intimations that we are not following proper protocol are otherwise or are otherwise outside of legal boundaries are embarrassing and indicative of your general failure to understand not only the law, but the very nature of your office as a public rep representative. I assure you, our own potential lawsuit in Arkansas has been discussed with lawyers who agree that our approach is sound and that our request for sponsorship can't arbitrarily be ignored. Exchanges such as these, assuming any future litigation on the matter, are likely to become a matter of public record, so it might behoove you to reply with professionalism, address the actual question asked, and otherwise try to lessen the shame surrounding the revelation of prevalent constitutional ignorance in the Arkansas government that seems ripe for inevitable exposure. Thank you in advance for your reply that will, hopefully, finally address the question of sponsorship. Again, if you have any further questions, I'm delighted to help. Love. <laughs> And she said, thank you for writing me about things important to you. I have received your request. <laughs> so then, 
they put up the Ten Commandments monument, and somebody ran it over. <laughs> and it was a crazed Christian, a born again Christian, actually. And uh, Senator Rapert, uh, in a press conference talking about this, went off on some digression about, again, about how I'm a criminal and possibly insane. He was talking about me, and I'm not even sure why, because it wasn't even the question. But he was trying to put the blame for the Ten Commandments monument being run over somehow on the actions of the Satanic Temple and the ACLU because we inspired such hatred against it. Um, because it was run over, and we were actually going to file our lawsuit the next day, uh, we had to withhold our lawsuit because it could get thrown out on standing grounds. If the monument isn't actually up, they can say you don't actually have a grievance, so they can throw the suit out and then they can put the monument up the next day. But um, we're waiting now for that monument to go back up and then we will sue. Um, but you do see when we do these things that there's a certain issue of public education on these matters. And when people fight to have uh, prayer in school, Bibles in school, and God we trust on money, these are not benign things. And I, I've come to realize that more and more, seeing what we're doing. Because when we've offered to give invocations before city council sessions where they open them up with Christian prayer, and, and they're not supposed to discriminate against other religious groups giving those invocations, the public gets very upset. And they obviously get very upset thinking that us speaking before the city council is a reflection upon the city as a whole. They must think that in the reverse as well, that when a Christian invocation is given, that this is a message out there, that this is the endorsed religion of the city, that this is the, the officially sanctioned religion, and they get very upset that another voice could come in. And it really shows you a certain value in the separation of church and state, and perhaps people shouldn't be fighting these fights in the public forums anyway, and, and leave them somewhere outside. In nowhere was this more apparent than in Arizona, in Phoenix, when we offered to give the invocation there. Um, it, originally, our chapter, our Arizona chapter, offered to give the opening invocation for a city council meeting, and it was, it was approved as a matter of bureaucratic course, and not much was said. And then sometime when the date was approaching, it suddenly caught a lot of attention, and, and the news blew up over it. And Phoenix was in chaos. I, I had no idea um, that, that Phoenix could degenerate into an old school kind of tent revival the way it did. But in the session before the meeting in which we were supposed to give the invocation, they decided to deliberate on whether they would keep the invocations happening at all or they would migrate over to a policy of having a moment of silence, uh, a neutral, secular moment of silence before the city council deliberations. And this uh, is a clip from some of the rhetoric that was being stated by the public in, in trying to uh, make the argument that we had no right to speak. And ironically, they were saying that we had no right to speak because they speculated that we were trying to censor religious speech. And, um, and they also, and it was really bizarre, um, they allowed some woman to speak for about 10 minutes and she was talking about how we're a, a misogynistic hate group because our chapter had uh, uh, a, a, wo a woman in Arizona who is, who is our chapter head, she does modeling and sometimes she does nude modeling and sometimes, somehow this is an advocation of violence against women. There is a constitution greater than the American Constitution, and it is substantiated or sustained by God himself. I'm going to read the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Satanism is not a religion. It's a cult. I think their goal is to silence prayer as opposed to doing invocations. Their goal is to silence any kind of prayer whatsoever. We take a Pledge of Allegiance that's one nation under God. That's not out there by mistake. How many people actually have a dollar bill or a piece of money in their wallet or their pocket? I do believe it says, in God we trust. And I've got people that are ready 
to demonstrate if you don't stand up for God. And right now, our domestic enemies seem to be pretty great. They are a hate group, and specifically, they are a misogynist group. You will see images of Michelle Short in bondage, in nudity, um, in all kinds of uh, positions that are not appropriate. A hate group who promotes violence against women. Their main goal is to silence any expression, any religious expression in public life. I do agree with you that it is a cult. It's not a real religion. It just isn't. Their main goal, and I want to drive this home, is to silence the other side. It, it, it could be considered to be by a woman like me to be terrorism. We can't allow the members of the city council and mayor to pick and choose who they want to give the invocation and only invite those people. It has to be open. And this country was founded on the principles of Judeo-Christian principles. We are not going to practice our religion behind our closed doors and behind the churches. We're going to practice it right here at City Council. Don't sell your soul on this. Our nation was founded on Judeo-Christian values and prayers. If we abandon him, he will abandon us. You will answer to God. I represent Jesus Christ. And when I hear all these people talking and they say, under God, well, which God are you talking about? I heard that gentleman just say, Jesus Christ. So if you're a Jew, is it not your God? Or is it a Muslim? Or are we just going with the religions of Abraham? Either you have everybody or you have nobody. It saddens me to hear what's going on. I'm a Christian. I believe in the one true God. I want Christians to pray. I want those that believe in God, the one true God, to pray, and it will bring blessings to everyone. We are one nation under God, believe it or not, like it or not. I believe a Satan worshiper would just bring curses. I recommend the elimination of the invocation from the agenda. The motto for our nation is, in God we trust. You seem to think that this prayer thing is all about you guys. But you work for us. You represent us. You aren't individuals who can say, this prayer is good, that prayer is bad. But I myself served in a country called Iraq. It's none of my business how you vote, if you don't want to tell me, and how you pray. Because I don't need a middleman between me and my God. I don't need a high priest. Christianity is becoming irrelevant, and being politically correct is becoming relevant. We want to lift up the name of Jesus. There is no other name in heaven on earth whereby a man must be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. Let's get that straight. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is the way. I'm a proud atheist, and I am here to ask you as government officials to honor the minority, to honor the minority in this community. This is a spiritual thing. This is in the spiritual realm. This is evil against good. And the devil is out, to, Satan is out to win. And we don't want to give him Phoenix. Many years ago, or more than 200 years ago, our government had a good idea to, in the First Amendment to keep separate religion and government. Also in Article 6, Paragraph 3, they said that elected representatives are bound by an oath to the Constitution, not to the Bible. Now, because I don't bow to an Abrahamic God, does that make me subject to a tweet? that says that I'm too stupid to be represented by this council, I'm done. Matthew 6.6 6 specifically states, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What we need to be doing is trying to put inclusion into government. I have personal knowledge of what Satanists do. Now, this was a long time ago. I know the city of Phoenix is making a bad decision by inviting Satanists for a prayer. Um, as for the Satanist prayer coming the 18th, I don't believe that the city has a choice but to allow it to happen. It is the goal of Satan to silence and muzzle people's voices. Our goal is not to shut down the Satanists, but it's our goal to shut down their agenda, which is to bring death and destruction over Phoenix. I'm with those that hold that everyone here is entitled to believe whatever they choose to believe. What they're not entitled to do is to impose 
each of their beliefs on all the rest of us. I challenge anyone here to open their Bible and find the word democracy or republic in it. It isn't there. We do not live in a Judeo-Christian culture. So are we invoking still the blessings of God on our state and our city? Are we invoking the curses of the deity spoken of that they serve as Satan? When I took my oath of citizenship, it was under God. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Because I would not let El Chapo play marbles with my children. Or Jack el Destripador. Or, or Jack the... Uh, the Dios me los bendiga. God bless. The government has no business in establishing a religion, but they have no business in regulating it either. I want you to know that, that there are things worse than lawsuits for you to consider. can't imagine having a Satanist church come here and, and invoke the powers of darkness over the city of Phoenix when most of us pray every day to keep him away from us, to keep him out of our lives. A member of this committee asks that anyone who approves of the upcoming invocation of the Satanic Temple should put their name in the record. I, Jocelyn Nicole Nickel, proudly stand with Thomas Jefferson and sign my name to protecting and defending the Constitution of the United States of America. I know it wasn't what they were trying to do when they held up the money or said that they took their citizenship oath in the, in the name of God, but to me that says that those things should not be, and, and that they should leave those uh, divisive religious questions alone. And we see that, uh, that this idea of, of public indoctrination into the idea of exclusive privilege for one religious viewpoint is very much now being pressed into schools, and the Satanic Temple is doing a lot to push back against that. Um, one thing we do where we invoke the same kind of claims based on our tenets for bodily autonomy is we challenge the states in the school districts that, have, that allow corporal punishment. There's still 19 states that allow the administration to uh, administer punitive beatings and we do have an exemption form for that available online that kids can take to the school and say that it's, it's uh, against their religious persuasion to be beaten. And so if that kid is beaten, um, identifying with our tenants, then we will sue. We haven't been able to test that one out yet, but to the, uh, the evangelicals, uh, the real fundamentalist types have recently, or not too terribly recently, but in, at some point, they isolated the 4 to 14 window. And that, the idea there is that you have to catch a, a mind uh, between the ages of 4 and 14, because if you don't catch them then, you're never going to be able to truly indoctrinate them. And they push very hard to get, uh, to, to get their materials into schools, and we see similar ploys to those that have the Christian monuments up on, on in free speech zones. We have passive distribution of religious fundamentalist literature at schools, and the idea is that anybody can set up a table and, and allow the children to come and take it. You're not allowed to actively go and, and force it into their hands, but they're able to, able to take any of the material, so these evangelical groups will go and they'll set up Bibles and Jesus literature and things like that. And in Florida, that was going on with some Gideon's type group where they had a bunch of biblical material and then we asked to be able to put our activity book there. And the uh, original, uh, the original flurry of press this provoked, of course, it, it, it initiated a lot of outrage. But the school district uh, kind of kept their poise with the media and they said that they reserved the right to turn down any material that they didn't deem appropriate. So they were putting forward this idea that they would be able to turn us down uh, somehow and that it would be legal because they somehow had that right. And they, they had that right to a certain degree if it were uh, pornographic or, or uh, really demonstrably offensive in some way and inappropriate for children. Um, I mean, let's not get into what the Bible says in it. Um, but but they, they may have grounds to turn us down there. So we... Uh, ultimately turned in something that was 
so inoffensive that they, uh, that there was just no way they could turn it down. And the only reason they wanted to was because it was going to be distributed by the Satanic Temple and it had some Satanic symbolism in it. Um, but otherwise, there's absolutely nothing offensive about it. So in order to not have this, the horrors of this activity book come into their schools, they shut down the forum entirely. And here were some of the clips from that. Satanic children's coloring book is creating controversy in Orlando but if you read between the lines, the issue is a lot deeper than black and white. The Orange County School Board is considering changing its police regarding religious materials after a group of local Satanists asked to hand out a Satanic-themed coloring book. The request is in response to the board allowing other religion, religious groups, that is, to leave Bibles and booklets for students. Public education in America often uses coloring books to teach young Americans about math, science, and current events. This year, a new book filled with games and lessons about Satanism could be distributed to students attending public school in Florida's Orange County. The 10-page Satanic Children's Big Book of Activities features characters named Annabelle and Damien who demonstrate rituals to explain Satanism. This expanding wealth of information for America's young minds was made possible after a Florida judge last month ruled that if the Orange County School District allowed Christian groups to disseminate Bibles and other materials in its schools, then other religious and atheist groups should be given the same right to distribute their material. And followers of the Antichrist seized on the decision to treat all faiths equally. A spokesman for the Satanic Temple tells Raw Story that, quote, if a public school board is going to allow religious pamphlets and full Bibles to be distributed to students, as is the case in Orange County, Florida, we think the responsible thing to do is to ensure that these students are given access to a variety of different religious opinions, as opposed to standing idly by while one religious voice dies dominates the discourse and delivers propaganda to youth, unquote. Bible distributions are, are a good thing. Uh, they haven't caused any problems. Uh, they've, they've gone on without incident. Uh, but now by creating controversy, uh, this group is, is maybe perhaps getting what it wants. In my office alone, I received close to 11,000 emails in one 48-hour period on this issue. And it gives you an idea of the level of disruption that it was causing. A spokesperson for the Satanic Temple says it's laughable that religious groups think that the inability to distribute their materials exclusively is discriminatory against them. I think if you're going to put our material juxtaposed to the standard material, you're going to find that Satan is wildly popular with the kids. In a ruling that was aimed at maintaining religious neutrality, students who may never have intended to learn about Christianity, atheism, or Satanism will now receive an introduction to all three. Well, it's true. They've all seen the biblical material before. I think everybody would have been hoarding our table, and I think that was the, the real fear that, that we were going to be far more popular. But... Um, there's been uh, far more insidious and destructive ways that uh, theocrats have been encroaching into the schools. And in uh, 2001, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Child Evangelism Fellowship to be able to run after school clubs and in public schools that put forward a very uh, distinct fundamentalist evangelical point of view with a curriculum that teaches children that they must either uh, step in line with their religious precepts or that they will burn in hell. There's a, a great site that talks about these good news clubs. Uh, they're called the Good News Clubs and they're run by the Child Evangelism Fellowship. And, and they went through the curriculum and they looked at the thematic frequency of, of certain things. Um, the, the, the obsession with obedience, uh, sin, uh, the dark heart, I believe, was some kind of uh, personal blame upon, upon the child. The punishment and hell. Uh, it's a very destructive, supernatural way of thinking, and it's a very guilt-ridden way of thinking. And the problem is, is that um, they run these after-school clubs, and something we found is that uh, you have some school districts that get, have an early day out of school. Uh, I don't know what you call it, in-service or whatever, but... Um, S say in uh, Arizona was one of the school districts 
uh, school would let out an hour early and that hour gap was filled by a good news club and some parents had no choice but to have their kids go to the good news club as a type of daycare. They would also set up back to school tables where they would kind of try to coerce children with cookies and candies and balloons and other fun activities. And they put forward this propaganda that claims they're completely non-denominational and they, they just kind of teach good character building values. And they're non-denominational in the way that they will accept a child from any religious background to be indoctrinated into their evangelical way of thinking. Um, but, what's, but again, uh, what's good for them is good for us. So uh, last year, a year ago, we rolled out our program and I worked with a journalist at Washington Post to first introduce the idea and we released it with a, a rather catching uh, a kind of meant to provoke video that we knew would, would kind of uh, shake people into questioning uh, the wisdom in allowing this open doors to any group to come into the schools. And this was when we introduced the after school Satan clubs. <laughs> Beyond that, the, the kind of curriculum we put forward was actually uh, very straightforward based on critical thinking, uh, fun activities, thinking skills, and we actually did develop a, a good deal of interest from parents and educators, uh, specifically those who had been screaming for a long time about the Good News Clubs and seeing nothing done about it. And I, I have to congratulate us on, on being very uh, keeping it very on point with the media, we made sure that people knew exactly what the Good News Clubs and what they were about and why our club was important in relation to it. And we're still kind of fighting that fight now. We've opened the, we're still yet to uh, file suits against some of the school districts that just simply refuse to have us, even though they had Good News Clubs in their facilities. And now we've opened up the curriculum to a volunteer network. Previously, last year, it was only being run by chapters. Uh, they need to be chapters of the Satanic Temple. 
Now it doesn't need to be chapters. Um, people can get on our insurance policy. They can apply. Um, we'll walk them through the curriculum. So if anybody's interested um, and you know of a good news club in any of your schools or any other evangelical group that's uh, pushing its agenda into the schools, uh, let me know and we can give you our volunteer manual. But before I close, I wanted to tell you about a, a project we work on that a lot of people are completely unaware of because it's kind of a complex issue and uh, a lot of the headlines we get, of course, are, are, are people writing clickbait materials and they just want to write something salacious about, um, about Satanists fighting against the state or whatever else. But one thing we're doing is we're fighting back against the propagators of satanic panic. And I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term, but there was a moral panic in the 80s and 90s known as the satanic panic, and it was in part fueled by debunked pseudoscientific uh, therapeutic practices in the mental health community designed to recover repressed memories of trauma that would sometimes uh, develop into these uh, wide uh, overarching conspiracy narratives related to satanic cults that never existed. It was similar for the movement that believed that people were being abducted by aliens, but they're still in practice today, and I work with a bunch of people who uh, talk to people who've undergone this kind, of, uh, this kind of destructive therapy that's really kind of ruined their lives and has given them uh, memories of traumatic abuse that never happened, and many of them realize they haven't happened. And you still find a very, uh, a very delusional, deranged fringe of people within the mental health field who still have their licenses. And when mentally vulnerable people come to them, um, instead of giving them better grounding in reality, uh, they give them a crippling paranoia related to Satanists, the Illuminati, or whatever else. And, and this isn't hyperbolic. Uh, we, we've gone to some of the conferences and recorded what's happened in Religion Dispatches, uh, wrote this kind of uh, confusing piece, confusing, I think, to people outside. Uh, Satanists infiltrated ritual abuse conference in Oakland, your guide, guide to what happened and why. It went on to go into a Q&A format. Uh, who goes to an event like this? Some people believe they suffered abuse they cannot remember, have alternate personalities which they are unaware of, or have even committed crimes they cannot recall, all because of sadistic rituals inflicted on them in the form of mind control. Who do they think is responsible for the psychological abuse? The usual suspects include unnamed cults, the CIA, and an alleged conspiracy of organized criminal Satanists. And then actual Satanists showed up? They did. Amidst all this paranoia, Satanists actually had infiltrated the conference, and they went public with the reason why. In a twist worthy of a bad M. Night Shyamalan film, the Satanists claim that they are the ones exposing a dangerous cabal, and that it is the conference organizers who are abusing their patients. You have uh, professional organizations like the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, and they still host these special interest groups that talk about uh, mind control and ritual abuse. This was some of the footage uh, some of our Grey Faction people got from going to one of these ritual abuse conferences, and the person who was talking was a conference organizer, and he was obsessed with uh, people touching their faces, and that if they touch their face, they might be trying to cue, uh, trigger certain cueing in people's mind control that would make them revert to some government mind control programming. I shit you not. You know, one big thing is try not to go to your face at all. Um, brush your hair, touch your glasses, anything. Those can be construed as triggers every year. We, not not every year, but a lot of times we have trouble with those things. If you have any cheap face fit on your hands, um, we'll be coming up to you and telling you not to do those things uh, politely. And if you keep doing them, we'll have to ask you to leave. And we don't want to do that. So, so try to sit on your hands. Okay. So a lot of accessing methods, obviously visual ones, are are they, I mean, a lot of, I see people with itchy faces here going to their faces a lot, even now, even after what I said. If anyone else goes to their face, I'm doing it to that fast. So, we'll be going to the last moment. Yeah, that's good.
I mean, imagine people like this working at rape crisis counseling centers and getting people in, in distress who don't really have a context for what's going on and then being exposed to this kind of insanity. Um, as I said, the International Society for the Study of Trauma Dissociation on its veneer is this kind of respectable mental health organization, but they do run this organization, they have this sub-organization, the Ritual Abuse Mind Control Special Interest Group, and in it, uh, until we kind of did some expose work on her. Uh, they had as their contact a woman named Ellen Lachter, and if you looked at her site, um, she was very invested in uh, Illuminati stories and, and stories of, of witchcraft cults and satanic cults, and she has this uh, bizarre deranged website where she was obviously walking around the woods and around her or her home or somewhere local to her and, and inferring all these things about satanic practices or whatever else. She's a deeply disturbed woman, and it was our own research that revealed her role in the death of the eight-year-old, or her, her possible role in the death of uh, this eight-year-old autistic child, Jude Mira, who was murdered by his multimillionaire mother, Gigi Jordan, in New York, um, I believe in 2008. Uh, Gigi Jordan was under the impression that her child was not severely autistic, but was somehow acting out against secretive abuse that was taking place against him by some kind of unseen satanic cult. Even though she admitted she was always with the child and hadn't witnessed this herself, she thought that this was taking place. When she was going to get psychological help, if she had encountered somebody with, uh, with some kind of rational hold upon reality rather than Ellen Lachter, we believe that she might not have killed her child as her reasoning for killing Jude uh, by forcing an overdose of, uh, of Xanax and Klonopin and some other mixture, Ambien and vodka and a bunch of other stuff. Her justification from this was that she was preserving him from future tortures at the hands of some kind of satanic cult. We wrote up a petition to have her uh, license reviewed and hopefully repealed by the state of California. It had 2009 supporters by the time we were done with it. And in it we said that we request that Ms. Lacker's possible cultivation of Gigi Jordan's filicidal delusions be investigated for suspicion of gross incompetence, if not abetment of murder, and that her mental competence be professionally evaluated. We are not interested in the testimony of Ms. Lacker's current or past clientele as it seems a common element of conspiracism that the imagined revelation of an overarching delusional truth claim can be believed as freeing or healing, even while placing one in the subjective universe of suspicion, crippling fear, and hopeless withdrawal from reality. Again, Ms. Lachter's own professional materials are, in our opinion, self-evidently indicative of mental illness and her incompetence as a mental health care professional, insofar as her ability to act as an arbiter of rational truth claims are concerned. It is our opinion that evidence strongly suggests that Ms. Lacker's mental illness contributed to the murder of an eight-year-old child, Jude Michael Mira. We further contend that the very public nature of Ms. Lacker's delusional claims call into question the competence of the oversight processes that continue to allow her licensure. After some nine months, I think, of, of sitting on that, they essentially sent us, sent us uh, or sent me a form letter that can be summarized as fuck you because it, it said nothing and it said nothing specific, said they looked at it and then they closed the case and forgot about it. And she's still in practice and no more is to be said about it. I hate to end on such a negative note as that, but I bring it up because it's a very important project to us. I'd like if people interested would check out greatfaction.org. And of course, when I speak to a crowd like this, so uh, students and, and professionals, um, if you have any advice to give or services to offer to this end that you'd like to volunteer, talk to me or email info at the satanictemple.com and let us know. Thank you very much. <laughs>